This lecture will focus on the kind of terms and definitions that go along with understanding solutions and concentration. And we're going to start out kind of with just some basics here. Initially, just talking about what a solution is. Uh, we've talked a little bit about solutions in Unit 6 when we talked about types of matter, mixtures, heterogeneous mixtures, homogeneous mixtures. Remember that solutions are the same as homogeneous mixtures. So we have talked about solutions a little bit. And here I just have kind of a silly example of a solution that maybe you're familiar with, which would be a Kool-Aid drink. So we'll come back to this and use some vocabulary to describe Kool-Aid a little more um, technically. All right, a few definitions about solutions. These three terms look very similar, but they are all three very different. So you want to make sure you understand these terms and the differences, have these definitions handy, and try to apply them to real examples to make them more familiar to you. Starting with solution. The solution is what you end up with at the end. It's a homogeneous mixture. And remember, we learned about in unit six that a homogeneous mixture will look the same throughout. So in chemistry, when we're using solutions, they are transparent. That does not mean that they don't have a color. They could be colorless and clear, or they could have a color and be clear. So it could be like the Kool-Aid, have a red color, but also be transparent. So it doesn't have to be a clear solution that looks like water. It could have a color to it, but it contains a solute and a solvent to create the solution. And those terms will define here. So solute, um, the substance or substances being dissolved. It's a common misconception that these have to be solid. They could be solid or liquid or gas, and we'll talk about all of these examples throughout the notes. Um, and it's also good to be aware that you could have more than one solute. You know, you could dissolve sugar and salt in water, and both the sugar and the salt would be solutes. The solvent is the substance in which the solute dissolves. Usually for our purposes, that's almost always water. Water actually has the um, sometimes the nickname the universal solvent because a lot of things can dissolve in water. Um, but one way that you can figure out what the solvent is if you're you know given a solution is it's always the majority component. So you're always only going to have one solvent. You could have more than one solute, things that you're throwing into the solvent, but the solvent is going to be whatever you have the most of. And you'll you'll see that in some questions, and we'll talk about that later in, in situations where we might have more than one solvent. So back to our Kool-Aid example. Using those three terms to describe this Kool-Aid, we would say that the solution is our final Kool-Aid drink that you made. That would be a solution. And you can see, you know, if you made this, it's clear. You can see the ice cubes in it. But it does have a red color to kind of drive home that idea that it doesn't have to be clear and colorless. The solute in this case would be the Kool-Aid powder itself, right? You take that, and in this case, it is a solid. And then you dissolve that in water. So water would be our solvent here. And of course, again, it, it um, defends the idea that the solvent is the majority component. So you definitely have more water here than you have Kool-Aid powder. Another thing to know is acids and bases. We haven't talked too much about acids and bases, but acids and bases are solutions that are very commonly used in chemistry. So just so you understand, we've talked more about acids. Acids contain the hydrogen ion. So you kind of are familiar with these types of formulas already. You see the H in front. So we have hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic, nitric, perchloric, and sulfuric acid. These are all strong acids. The one we haven't learned as much about are strong bases. And I've mentioned this in a previous video, but strong bases will contain the hydroxide ion. And that's why when you combine an acid and a base, we learned about neutralization reactions. They form water, and it's because the acid has a hydrogen ion and the base has a hydroxide ion. So when you combine those, they obviously make water. So notable strong bases are group one and two metals that are combined with the hydroxide ion. So you have sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, and rubidium hydroxide. And then with group 2 metals, calcium hydroxide, barium hydroxide, and strontium hydroxide. So just make sure you can recognize acids and bases. And at this point, you can just use the formulas to figure that out. There are other definitions that we won't get into.
just so you understand in the chemistry lab the way you make a solution you want to make sure you know its concentration and you make a very specific uh, concentration of the solution you want and in order to do that we'll talk about what kind of calculations you would do first but what you would do is you would measure out um, the amount of your solute in this case it's a solid you would take that um, solid solute and put it in what's called a volumetric flask is this piece of glassware this piece of glassware is very special it has one calibration line so it's very exact which tells you how how high to fill it up to a certain volume in this case it's a 500 milliliter volumetric flask there are different sizes so you would put that solid in there and then you would start filling it with your solvent. In this case, it's ethanol. Normally, we would use water. It just depends on what your what solution you're making. So you'd fill it up, but you don't fill it up all the way to the line, as you see here, because then it's hard to mix. You want to fill it up just part way so that you can swirl it and shake it and make sure all of your solute dissolves. Once it's all dissolved, then you very carefully fill it up um, just to that mark, and then you'll have the exact concentration that you desire. Some jokes for you, obviously. This one's hanging up in the room. Chemists have all the solutions. It's good to be a chemist um, as opposed to, you know, being a mathematician. They've got a lot of problems. They've got a lot of solutions. It's a good thing. Solubility is a term I'm sure you've heard about. What this refers to specifically is the maximum amount of substance that can be dissolved in a, in a given volume of solvent. Usually this is expressed in amount of grams per 100 milliliters. So in other words, if you were looking at the solubility of table salt, um, the number you would get is how many grams of table salt you could dissolve in 100 milliliters of water. So, um, and as you've probably seen, you know, you can dissolve salt up to a limit. There's a limit where it will stop dissolving, okay? And that's how you measure solubility. And different substances will have different limits. Some you can dissolve more and some you can dissolve less. So that brings us to the term saturation and there's some different terms you need to know with that. An unsaturated solution means that you could dissolve more solute uh, into the solvent. Okay, so you could keep adding more. A saturated solution means that you've reached that limit and if you add more solute, it's just gonna sit there. Um, so you've maybe played around with salt water and, and seen this before. A super saturated solution you may have not seen before. It's kind of a special case and it's really cool. I'll show you a video here of a super saturated solution. You have to be kind of um, clever to make a super saturated solution um, and you kind of play around with temperature. So one way to make a super saturated solution is to heat up the solution. And oftentimes if you give it heat, the let's say if we're doing salt water we can dissolve more and then you slowly cool it back down to room temperature and this the salt that you had dissolved will stay in the solution as long as you do it carefully and don't agitate it if you agitate it it will just precipitate out and all of the solute that you dissolved will crystallize and so for that reason it's considered to be unstable and I'll sh in the video, it, I'll show you what happens. So anything could kind of make it crystallize and precipitate out. It could, if you agitate it, if you shake it, if a bubble forms, or if you drop a little seed crystal in there, it will instantly solidify. It's pretty cool to see. So you have to be really careful with super saturated solutions. So here's an example. Um, this stuff, sodium acetate, is actually used in certain types of hand warmers. If you've ever seen the liquidy hand warmers where you, you like snap a little metal button and then they get really, they solidify, they get really hot uh, immediately. That's actually a super saturated solution of sodium acetate. So what's happening here is this solution that the person's pouring is a super saturated solution. When you pour it onto some crystals of sodium acetate, because it's so unstable, it will immediately solidify once it touches those crystals. And so you can build these kind of cool structures with a super saturated solution of sodium acetate. All right, solubility equilibrium. This idea is going off of that situation where you have tried to put in more solute than is possible to dissolve. So let's say, you know, we have some salt water and we've added more salt than it can take. And so we just have some salt sitting on the bottom. 
Solubility equilibrium refers to this idea that the salt is not just sitting there. Actually, what's happening is there's an equilibrium happening where some of the solid salt is going into solution at the same time that some of the salt in solution is solidifying. So it's not like it's just sitting there. It's actually very active, but you have more of it in this solid form. So there's an equilibrium that exists here. It's both becoming uh, dissolved and undissolved simultaneously. So you just want to be aware that that's the case. It's not just stagnant sitting there doing nothing. This idea that like dissolves like is a very common theme in chemistry. And what that means is we've talked about intermolecular forces. So you have to think back to unit five. We learned about three types of intermolecular forces, dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bonding. And remember that those intermolecular forces depend on the polarity of the molecule that we were talking about, right? So in general, what happens is polar solvents can dissolve polar solutes, like dissolves like. And in the opposite case, nonpolar solvents can dissolve nonpolar solutes. Um, so this is an example of this that you've probably seen before, is when you mix oil and water, or for certain salad dressings, you know, you'll notice that if you just let it sit, they'll separate out. And the reason for this is because oil is nonpolar and water is polar, so they won't mix. Remember, like dissolves like, so in order for them to mix, they have to have the same type of polarity and have similar intermolecular forces. Um, and there's a term for this, and the term is called um, miscible or immiscible. So miscible means that uh, they, the substances can combine to form a solution. So this is when we have two liquids that we want to combine. Immiscible means that they cannot combine to form a solution. So uh, again, kind of this like dissolves like idea. If you mix ethanol and water, and you can see from their structures that they're both polar, you would have a miscible solution. They would mix together. On the other hand, if you try to combine something like octane, that's very nonpolar, you can see from its structure here, and water, which we know is polar, it would be immiscible. So this would be another type of oil and water situation. Okay, so miscible means they can mix, kind of like mixable, and immiscible is like not mixable. And that's for liquids. Um, temperature and pressure can also have effect on how soluble a substance is. So you want to make sure, and this can be pretty tricky depending on what the solute is. So for example, if the solute is a solid, so here we're talking about a solid dissolved in a liquid solvent. As the temperature increases, there's actually not a, a trend to predict whether the solubility will increase or decrease. Sometimes it will increase, sometimes it'll decrease, and sometimes it'll stay the same. So it's kind of impossible for you to predict whether or not increasing the temperature will help the solubility or not. And pressure for solids really doesn't have much of an effect on solubility of solids as well. So for solids, there's not a whole lot you can do. Temperature will have an effect or it might not. Pressure doesn't really have much of an effect. With gases, however, there are things to consider. If you are dissolving a gas in a liquid, um, for example, like carbon dioxide gas into water, if you increase the temperature, the solubility will decrease, meaning less gas can be dissolved in the water. Um, an example of this is, and I'll talk about soda pop a lot because it's something we're kind of familiar with. Um, this is why if you have like a warm soda, it tends to go seem to go flat faster, right? Because if it's hotter outside as the temperature increases, the solubility is decreasing of the carbon dioxide, so the carbon dioxide will be escaping. Less carbon dioxide can be in your soda, um, and so it'll taste more flat. It's also why if you open a can of soda and it's hot, it fizzes more because less of that gas can be dissolved into your soda and it's trying to escape. Another thing to consider is pressure. So as partial pressure of the gas above a solution increases, solubility increases. Um, you can kind of think of this like if you have more of the gas available above, then you'll ob obviously have more of the gas dissolving in the substance. If you decrease the amount of that certain gas, like carbon dioxide, above the soda, say, um, then it will it will be less dissolved in the soda. And that's 
Again, why soda goes flat if you leave it out? Because there's not a lot of carbon dioxide above the soda. Um, so all the carbon dioxide in your soda will leave the solution and go into the air. And so that's why your soda goes flat. So when you're thinking about gases dissolved in liquid, it is helpful to think about soda pop and kind of your experiences with that with temperature and pressure. Solid hydrates are another thing to understand. Kind, they, have, they involve water, and you've actually seen these. This might look familiar. We actually did a, a lab where we did something like this in the physical chemical changes. Remember, you heated this substance. This is actually called a hydrate, and it's a compound that has water molecules in its structure. And what we did is we heated it, remembering we saw the color change, we saw condensation, and we figured out that what we were doing is just boiling the water away, and then we added water back and the color came back. So just so you're aware, the way we name hydrates is we want to specify the number of water molecules in its formula. So we use prefixes like mono, di, tri, tetra, those prefixes um, to specify how many water molecules are in it. So you name the first part like normal, so this would be cobalt to chloride. And then the way we write the formula is to use a little dot here, and then the number of water molecules. And so since this is six waters, we would say hexahydrate. Um, so it's a separate word. So cobalt to chloride hexahydrate would be the name of this hydrate. And we specify that because the water molecules are part of its structure. But as we saw in the lab, we can remove those by heating it. It's kind of cool substance. And there are uh, tons of different types of hydrates. The ones we used in the lab were copper, um, copper sulfate, I believe. So now we're on to common concentration units. There are various units that we use to calculate concentration. You might be familiar with the term concentration. Kind of, you know, if you make juice like Kool-Aid, and if it tastes more syrupy, it's more concentrated, right? And if you add more water, it's more dilute. Um, in chemistry, we want to be able to calculate the exact concentration, and there's various ways to do it. Chemists tend to use this um, concept, molarity, but it's a little more complicated, so we're going to save that for another video. And today we'll talk about more percentages and parts per million, which are pretty simple calculations to do. So for per percent solutions, there's a few different ways you can do it. You can talk about percent solutions in terms of mass of solute per mass of solution, m per m, mass mass, mass of solute per volume of solution, mv, or volume per volume. So the general equation is just to put the amount of solute, which we know will be a smaller amount, and divide it by the amount of solution, which is kind of like the total amount, times 100. When you plug in numbers to this, and the times 100 is just to turn it into a, a percentage, but the, um, when you use this general formula, you just have to be careful with the units. So remember, it, this amount could be a mass or a volume for both of these. But if you use mass, make sure it's in grams. And if you use volume, make sure it's in milliliters. So you'll see this will be pretty easy. So here's a practice problem. What is the um, mass per volume percent of a solution if 24.0 grams of sucrose is dissolved in a total solution of 243 milliliters. So remember, the general formula is to put, remember, you, you're kind of given the formula, right? Mass per volume. So you put the mass of the solute on top, you put the volume of the solution on the bottom. So if you want, go ahead and pause this, set up your calculation, see what you come up with. I'll give you a second to do that. Here is what the setup should look like. Got the mass on top, volume on the bottom. We have grams and milliliters. Don't forget to multiply by 100 to turn it into a percentage. Do that calculation if you want to pause again, see what you get. Be careful of sig figs. And you should get 9.88%. Three sig figs. Both of these numbers have three sig figs. Okay, right. pretty easy. Here's another one. If you want to pause and try it yourself, you can go ahead and do that. Otherwise, we'll walk through it. How many grams of NaCl are required to make 625 milliliters of a 13.5% solution? So this one's a little bit different. 
Um, we know we want grams, so this is going to be a mass per volume percent, but we're not solving for the percent, we're given the percentage. So knowing this formula, you're going to have to use algebra to rearrange it a little bit. So if you want to pause and try it on your own, you can do that. Keep in mind we're solving for the mass here. So what you'll do is multiply both sides by the volume to solve for your mass. So you're going to get the percent times the volume to get your mass. Keep in mind that this is a percent, so when you plug that in, you have some options, right? You can use the 13.5, um, but you'll have to divide by 100. Otherwise, you can just move. What I did is I just moved the decimal to put it into a decimal form. So the 0.135, that's the 13.5 percent, right? Times the volume, 625 milliliters. Type that into your calculator. See what you get with the correct sig figs and rounding. Should get 84.4 grams. So that's how many grams of sodium chloride you would need in that solution. And the last type of concentration that we'll talk about today is parts per million or PPM. This is used when you have a really low concentration. Uh, it's, it is exactly what it sounds like, parts per million of the um, solution. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking the mass of the solute, dividing by the mass of the solution. It should look kind of familiar to the last um, formula. But this time you're multiplying it by a million because it's such a small amount. The other way you can think about this, and this is often how the problems will be given to you, is to put the milligrams, put the solute in units of milligrams, and put the solution in units of kilograms, and then you don't need to do this times a million because it's factored into these different units here. So you can just do that, and oftentimes the problem will give you these units already, so you can just go ahead and plug it into this. Um, and there's no times 100 or anything like that. So you're just doing that, and that will give you units of ppm. Okay, um, So that's it for today, just talking about the basics of solutions and some general concentration calculations. So hopefully that makes sense. Make sure you let me know if you have questions.